That story you can find on YouTube. <laughs> Click on My Way to Islam, Bilal Phillips, it's there. I gave the whole talk in Australia, it's recorded up on YouTube. But briefly, I can just say that I went from Christianity as a nominal Christian. Nominal meaning like Muslims who are nominal Muslims, they're Muslim in name. I was a Christian in name, who went to church, but I wasn't involved in what was going on there. You know, the minister would be up there talking, I'd be there with my friends chatting. You know. <laughs> Later on, as you got older, we go to uh, Bible class or whatever. We went to Bible class to meet the girls. <laughs> you know? So that was a nominal Christian. You know? When I went to university and my understanding of the world and what was going on around me was opened up and I realized that there was this oppression and injustice and all these things going on around the world. I wanted to be a part of some movement for change and at the time when I was in the university professors uh, Jewish professors there were promoting communism amongst the youth so I heard enough of it and became a communist and I read studied and gave da'wah to communism. That went on for a few years, but the more I read, the more I became disillusioned. The more I moved with the Communist Party members, the more I realized that these people have no morals. We wanted to remove the existing president, but if any one of these guys got there, he would be worse. Yeah. And communism couldn't, uh, couldn't compete with capitalism economically. Communism fundamentally an economic theory couldn't compete with capitalism. In the beginning it was well, but then they got left in the dust. They couldn't compete. So I felt there was a vacuum there. This really wasn't the answer. And at a time when I was in that doubtful state, one of the members of the central committee of the group that I belong to, the Communist Party group, she accepted Islam. And I was shocked because I was a basic Marxist-Leninist, Russian type. She was a Maoist, hardcore, memorized Mao's red book. So I was shocked. She accepted Islam. I said, Whoa, how did you, why? What happened? You know, communism teaches you that religion is the opium of the masses. It intoxicates them so that the ruling class, the bourgeoisie, can exploit them. So how? She said, it's different. I said, what do you mean it's different? Islam is different. I had been to the States before and visited one of the centers of the nation of Islam I visited it and I was impressed by the way they organized themselves but when I listened to their theology what is their theology white people are devils 
black people are gods hey it's nonsense it's total nonsense I could never be a part of that so I said you know how is that I mean these people are talking nonsense he said no 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 they're not Muslims they call themselves Muslims nation of Islam later on I call them the nation of Mislam right? she said no real Islam is something else it has nothing to do with color and these kind of things so I said okay give me some books let me read and I began to read and the book by Muhammad Qutb called Islam the misunderstood religion when I read that and I'd read a book by Maududi towards understanding Islam just before that it was good but when I read Islam the misunderstood religion that was it that was it because that book was written from a political perspective comparing between communism capitalism socialism Christianity uh, Islam from social economic spiritual from all the different perspectives and systematically he just showed Islam was the answer so after finished reading that book that was it for me I was convinced but that wasn't enough for me now to become a believer in God because I'd been denying God's existence for years I was an atheist I didn't believe in God so you don't just flip overnight you know it's not like a light switch you turn it on it's on you turn it off it's off so it took a while for me to bring God back into my life to realize God as a reality in my life once that happened which was some months later I accepted Islam and after becoming a Muslim the group of people that I was around some new Muslims and the brother who gave me Shahada he was here in the Emirates uh, sorry in um, Malaysia uh, not too long ago Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick I don't know if some of you have attended some of his lectures he's been here he is the person who gave me Shahada anyway the point is that uh, at that time the most active group of Muslims that I saw was Jamaat Tabligh. right we had the leading representative for the Jamaat in North America there was with us he was nicknamed Colonel Saab he used to be a colonel in the Indian military his mom was a British woman father was an Indian big tall imposing individual turban very you know, active dynamic so we went out with him three days then I ended up on the four months went to the UK uh, based on the fact that I was told because I wanted to gain knowledge of Islam and we didn't have any books at the time Sayyid Bukhari only volume one was translated into English one two something like this so it was incomplete very little literature in fact most of the literature available was Ahmadi they had translated a lot of material and that was mostly available in English so I was told that in England they had many mosques and in every mosque there was a scholar a Maulana who I could study under so I said let me go get that knowledge so I went out the Jamaat traveled they had an ijtima there in Dewsbury and afterwards I stayed on to complete the four months going from masjid to masjid I would sit down with the Maulana with my notebooks and I would ask questions and write down the answers after doing that um, I was told that 
on one hand, <clears throat> I should focus on what I had been taught. I should read only the book for Zayl Amal. That's the only book I needed to read. And I was told that very plainly when I had gone to a bookstore, bought a stack of books, I came walking back in the masjid with the stack of books and the Jamaat brothers said, oh, Brother, what, what you got there? He said, I got a book, stack of Islamic books. Said, where did you get it from? From such and such a bookstore. I said, oh, oh. I said, whoa, whoa, what's wrong here? These books, you don't know the intention of the one who wrote them. So, leave that. For Zayl Amal, we know the intention of the author. Solid book, you keep reading that. I'd already read it like four times. They said, yeah, read it some more. Of course, my background, you know, of reading and wanting to gain knowledge, it left me suspicious. I didn't really like that. It was like a nasty taste in my mouth. And also, I found that they like to tell stories. Fantastic stories. You know when this guy went out on the Jamaat? That happened. Wow. This happened. Oh boy. I, I told him, listen, you know, I want to go and learn some Arabic. He said, no, don't need to, you don't need to go. I want to go to Mecca or Medina. You don't, you don't need to go to Mecca and Medina. The light of Islam has left Mecca and Medina and it is in Nizamabad in North India where Hazrat G, the head of the Jamaat, lives. And that light is so powerful that when Hindus walk the street and they pass by his house, they're hit. They come walking in Shahada. Ashadu Allah, ilaha illallah. I'm hearing these stories. I say, oh boy. That's a tough one. So, They told me that um, whilst we're in Ijtima, that they were having a spiritual bath. Would you come join the spiritual bath? And that's how I heard it anyway. Actually, what they were saying in Arabic was bay'a. In Urdu, it became bayat. And sound for us, the closest thing in English sounds like bath. So we, so we, the Westerners, we said spiritual bath. So we went into this room. Hazrat G was in the other room. And they had the, uh, towels tied in a string. right? And we just held on to the towel. And we heard him saying something in the other room. And then they came and said, okay, it's, it's over now. We let go. Spiritual bath is over. Mashallah, we left. So later, I asked the secretary of Hazaji. I asked him, "Well, what was that spiritual bath all about? You know, what does it mean?" He said, "It means that when you go back to Canada and you have to make any decision in your life, you write a letter to Hazaji." I will translate it into Urdu, he will read it, and then he will dictate back to me an answer and will send it back to you, and then you can make your decision. I said, oh, that doesn't sound right. I have an important decision to make in my life. I wait one week to ten days for the letter to reach there. Eventually gets translated after another week. Eventually gets read by Azra G after another week eventually gets sent back, retranslated and sent back. Three months have gone by for me to make that major decision in my life. I had a problem with that. Then, in the course of my traveling with the Jamaat, and I became like the protege of 
Colonel Saab. I used to sleep near him. And he taught me Tajweed, alhamdulillah. My first lessons in Tajweed was from him. He taught me Tajweed of the Quran. He was a Qadi. Alhamdulillah, I benefited. Eventually, he told me, listen, you know, as a Muslim, you must follow a madhab. There are four. They're all correct, but you must choose one. If you don't choose one, then your imam is shaitan. You got to choose an imam. One. And Imam Azam, Abu Hanifa, he is the best one. He was the first, closest to the Sahaba. He had the largest number of followers in the Muslim world. Most Muslims are Hanafis, the greater proportion of them. They are the largest. So I said, it makes sense, okay, if he was closest to the Prophet Sallallahu time, most Muslims are Hanafis, you know, then I'm a Hanafi, okay. So what does it mean to be a Hanafi? Well, we do things this way. And he taught me Hanafi Salah. For the men, nothing. It's basically the same thing. You just don't raise your hands after going into the court. But for women, the salah is acrobatics. The female salah of the Hanafis today is acrobatics. You have to be an acrobat. If you haven't been trained in acrobatics, you'll fall down on the floor, <laughs> trip over yourself. Because there is a special way that they go down to the floor. You don't go down reaching down knees and no, 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 no. For a woman to go down like the men, go down knees first, for example. You, the man, he goes down knees first. I said, no, a woman, you know, she must be covering, you know, you don't. So how does the woman go down? She has to crumble down. She just sort of crumbles. Right? And then she puts her chest on her thighs and her elbows on the ground and she's just huddled up. Ooh. First time I tried it, oh, I fell down. I couldn't do it. I had to practice till I was able to crumble down because I had to go back and tell my wife now. You know? When I came back, I said, we are Hanafis. She said, what's that? I said, don't worry about the details, but we are Hanafis, and you have to pray like this. <laughs> so, after I got back, we moved house, and I moved next to the masjid. And the brother whose house we rented an apartment in, he had a basement apartment, we rented it. He was from Egypt. His father was a scholar among the Ikhwan and he had been raised in scholarship. So he started to teach me from Fiqh Sunnah. Teach me Fiqh Sunnah along with Shafi'i Fiqh books. So I started to notice differences. Hmm. Of course, he was bringing evidences. He said, Prophet did it. Here's the proof. When I was with the Hanafis, there was no evidence. It's just, this is how you do it. Don't do this. You do that. You do this. Don't do that. And, and actually, when I was studying with them, I remember one occasion, because I was getting my information initially from Colonel Saab, and I found at one point in time that what he had told me when I sat with the Maulanas, some of them were saying something different. So I came back and I questioned Colonel Saab. He, Maulana so-and-so said that. He said, ah, this is a young guy, young Maulana. He just got out of Maulana school. He doesn't know how to wipe his behind in the winter or in the summer. I said, oh, there's a way to wipe your behind in the winter and the summer? He said, yes. It's not the same. When you wipe your behind in the winter, you are supposed to do it counterclockwise. And when you wipe it in the summer, you do it clockwise. Now, some of you might think this is a joke and it's not really like that, you know. 
But hey, when I went to Singapore some years back, I went to Singapore and they had a book which was for new Muslims. And I opened up the book and I was reading it. I found it right in there. They had it written up in there. It was a book which had been translated from Urdu, you know, by uh, Molvi, translated into English. And it had in there the description of how to wipe your behind in winter and summer. I told the people at the lot come, listen, you better get rid of this book. Anyway, the point is that this the brother who started to teach me Shafi Madhab, I started to see differences and I, questions were in my mind. Uh, Maulana Saab had said, uh, Colonel Saab had said that they're all right. So there was problems coming up here. I befriended some Moroccans, hung out with them, and the Moroccans that I hung out with, you know, though they were kind of nominal Muslims still, because they used to tell me, they said, you know, back home in Morocco, we break our fast with hashish. So you can understand what kind of nominal Muslims we're talking about. Anyway, but they had learned the ritual. They learned the Maliki ritual. So they said, uh, really, when you pray, you should pray with your hands by your sides. You know, Imam of Medina, Imam Malik. That's how he prayed, did this, that. You know, these were differences. I said, Ooh, problems. Because you can't do all of these things at the same time. How can they all be right? The Hanafis say if you touch a woman, your wudu is not broken. Shafi say if you touch a woman, your wudu is broken. If they're both right, it means that you can be in the state of wudu and out of it at the same time. I said, ooh, this is a problem here. It sounds like Trinity. You know? <laughs> How one plus one plus one can equal one. Hmm? We all know one plus one plus one equals three, but they say no, one plus one plus one equals one. To accept that and to believe it, what do you do? You have to turn your brain off. You cannot think this one out. It's just that's how it is. A divine secret. A divine mystery. Anyway, after reflecting on this, I decided I have to go to the center of Islam, where Islam came from, and learn Islam from the roots. Study Arabic and study the foundations of Islam to understand, to put all these things into context. And alhamdulillah, at that time when I made that decision, Scholarships were made available. Nobody wanted it. Nobody was interested. Myself and Abdullah Hakim, quick, we took it. People at the time were telling us, oh, Muslims around us who are more modern type Muslims, no, don't go there. They read old books with yellow pages and, you know, dust all over it. And hey, what are you going to do when you graduate? What are you going to do with this, you know? No, 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 no. Better you stay here. No, we were insistent. We wanted to go and get that knowledge. So we set out to Medina. And the rest is studying in Medina, graduating, studying in Riyadh, masters, teaching, completing PhD, becoming a professor, and here I am before you. Alhamdulillah. That's the short version of the story.